Hello, my name is Christophe Besson. I'm a software maintenance engineer here at Red Hat, working for the support delivery. I will explain how Leap works from a support perspective. In this presentation, I will at first make a brief introduction to give you the global picture. In a second time, I will focus on the two main parts of the upgrade process. So, what's Sleep? In a nutshell, it's a tool for handling upgrades to the latest generally available well 8 release. Its advantage being the ability to roll back in case it fails during this process. The upgrade is done in two steps. The first step is executed on the running World 7 OS. It runs many checks and then it downloads all the required packages from the repositories in order to fill the DNF catch. After that, a reboot is initiated on the new 4.18 kernel and then the real upgrade is done. Now, why not using YUM DNF directly for this task? DNF is one of the underlying tools, among others, used during the upgrade process. But there are too many changes between WELL 7 and WELL 8. It corresponds to a gap of eight versions in Fedora, so the DNF transaction would fail. The same kind of principles have been used previously in order to upgrade from RHEL 6 to RHEL 7. However, LIP provides a new way to do this by using more recent available techniques. We will focus on them later in this presentation. What are the main changes between RHEL 7 and RHEL 8 that complicates this task? As every new major release, it comes with some new software, and some of them, including drivers, have been deprecated or removed. For example, uh, the kernel module E1000, a NIC driver widely used in the past on some virtual platforms, is now deprecated. That means this module is still present in the kernel module tree, it is loadable, but it is not supported anymore. Uh, warning is printed while loading this driver tough. Another example is the removal of many PAM modules. For example, PAM TOLI2 has been deprecated in favor of PAM fail lock at the time of RHEL 7. And no, it is completely removed on RHEL 8. Another example is the PAM Carberos module, which is now superseded by uh, SSSD. So LIP detects this kind of configuration and warns, warns uh, the user during the upgrade step. Some package names have changed, many of them due to the move from Python 2 to Python 3. The move from YAM to DNF. As you know, RHEL 8 comes with reorganized repositories. BaseOS, which provides the core of the distribution, as its name indicates, and upstream, which provides modules as a replacement for their former well repositories. Grub2 moved to the free desktop bootloader specification. In other terms, the Grub configuration files have been organized differently. They are split in different parts with one file per boot entry. Obviously, this kind of charm 
uh, has to be taken into account very carefully. Now I'm going to explain how it works. Leap supports several backends. By default, Leap relies on the RHSM backend, thus it can work with CDN repositories or a satellite server. Custom repositories can be used too. It can also be a combination of both, in particular to provide third party updates. At the bottom of this slide, you can see the leap pre-upgrade command. Let's begin an upgrade in parallel of this presentation. For the demonstration purpose, I'm going to show a combination of RHEL hosted repositories providing the RHEL 8 packages with a custom repository, in this case, EPAL. As per the documentation, there are some prerequisites beyond the considerations about hardware support. Since we use CDN repo, the system has to be properly registered. Here it is already the case. We need to have the extra repositories configured as it provides lib and DNF for RHEL 7. Let's clean the catch at first. Here we have our mandatory repositories already configured, especially the RHEL 7 server RPMs and the RHEL 7 server extras RPMs. The system has to be up to date. Here we have a RHEL 7.9 release, the latest version of the RHEL series, with the latest kernel installed. Let's check if all is up to date. Good. Let's install lib and its dependency. As you can see, it comes with the DNF and the lying libraries. Now we have to download the table from the customer portal. It provides some files containing the repository names the list of packages, including the name changes, and for which architecture a given package is available. 
we don't have to deal with these files. It's intended for internal needs of Leap itself. We have to download this table. And then we have to extract it. In the following directory. As an example, I install a third party package from the EPEL repository. You might know HTOP. It's a useful tool. Thus, we need to define the EPEL 8 repository in order to provide an update for this package. has to be defined in the following file. The repo ID, the name, and the base URL are mandatory. Now we are ready for the in-place upgrade. So uh, I launch the lib command and I enable the repo using the EPL8 repo ID. It will take some time. We'll take a look on the result later. Let me describe all the phases involved in the upgrade process. The first one being the facts collection phase. Leap executes many commands to have an overview of the system configurations. Some gathered data, among others, are the hardware devices, the kernel-related configuration, the network configuration, and also SO Linux settings, subscriptions, uh, either desktop environment, and so on. In this phase, it also determines what to do for a given package. For example, glibc is obviously kept. As another example, uh, the Python 3 lib sumanage is installed to replace lib sumanage Python. This is almost the same package. One is for Python 3. The former one was for Python 2. As you can see, some package have been renamed, for example, the DHCP client instead of DH client. The kernel package itself is kept, but in fact it's the WAL7 kernel which is kept. The new kernel coming with WAL8 is packaged in kernel core and kernel modules, mainly. Next, the checks phase. Plenty of checks are done uh, during the upgrade process. Here is a short excerpt. For example, it checks if some old PAM modules are still in use in the current configuration, as explained previously. 
it also warns the user if some deprecated SSH algorithms are present in the OpenSSH configuration. LIP doesn't support encrypted partitions, so the upgrade is inhibited if Lux is used. LIP will also inhibit the upgrade if some deprecated drivers are loaded. Next phase, the target transaction fax collection. In this phase, LIP creates some overlay FS moons in order to make a try inside a container. The purpose is to leave the system unchanged. It gives the ability to roll back in case of any failure. Overlays, lower layers, are those of the host system. At least the directories below are mounted. Slash, the root file system itself, slash boot, slash var catch dnf, and possibly other partitions like slash var, slash user, and so on. Once the directories are mounted, lip uses systemd and spawn in order to launch a container. Inside this container, it runs dnf, the one from RHEL 7, that is to say dnf 4.0, to install dnf 4.2 from RHEL 8. The installation target is a subdirectory named EL8 target. By installing DNF 192 RHEL 8 package installed in this minimal root file system. Here is the global picture of this phase. As I said, host file systems are mounted using overlays to leave the system unchanged. On the contrary, the DNF catch is by mounted to preserve the downloaded package on the host system. The installation route being this directory itself by mounted from another one in the host in order to preserve the generated content. That way, we will have a minimal root file system in this directory will be used for the next step. Next phase is the target transaction check. In this phase, LIP reuse the minimal RHEL 8 root file system in order to check the full upgrade transaction. Inside the container, it runs a dedicated DNF plugin named RHEL Upgrade which use RHEL 8 underlying DNF libraries. It's executed in a target subdirectory named install root, which is an overlay FS using the host file systems as lower layers. I think it's easier to understand this phase thanks to that overview. Leap spawns a new container by using the minimal RHEL 8 generated in the previous phase to execute the DNF plugin in question. At this step, it just checks the DNF transaction is successful. In the next phase, the downloaded package will be catched here. They will be preserved on the host system. Here comes the download phase. Once the transaction check is successful, LIP invokes again the RHEL upgrade DNF plugin to download all the required package. This DNF catch will be used later for the real upgrade. The 
last phase before the reboot is named interim preparation. Lip use system D and spawn to install kernel and bracket packages inside the container. It generates a dedicated initramfs using the bracket command, working with the 4.18 kernel from L8. This initramfs includes a lib bracket module, which will proceed to the real upgrade. Finally, lib copies the new kernel alongside the upgrade initramfs into the slash boot of the host system, and it creates a new boot entry thanks to Grubby. The final action above is done only during the leap upgrade mode. Here comes the step where the user is involved. It's time to check the report and the logs. They are located in slash var log leap. If there is no inhibitor, the upgrade step can be launched. And after that, a reboot to proceed to the real upgrade has to be initiated. Let's come back to the demonstration. As you can see, the upgrade has been inhibited. As a precaution, the tool requires to permit the SSH root login. So let's change it just for the time of the upgrade. No, I run lip in upgrade mode. If it succeeds, it will add an upgrade entry in the bootloader, as I explained previously. I skip the wait, as it takes at least five minutes. This time, there was no inhibitor. Everything goes well in the first step, so we can reboot the system using the rail upgrade in HMFS entry in the grub menu. Before rebooting, let's check if my package from EPL has been downloaded too. Yes, it was. Now, let's see the real upgrade step. The reboot is done using the upgrade boot entry in the grub menu. The dedicated initramfs containing the upgrade.sh shell script is loaded. Everything is done offline, networking being disabled to make it easier. Lip is resuming the upgrade execution and spawns a container into slash sysroot. The grub and upgrade entry is removed. All file systems are mounted, including slash boot and possibly other file systems like slash var or slash user. The RAL7 product certificate is removed, and then YAM DNF configuration is updated. Now, the core of the upgrade is coming. Lip runs again the DNF plugin, well upgrade. This time the package are upgraded, installed, and some of them are removed. 
a new initramfs corresponding to the new kernel is generated grub2 is installed again on the boot disk and then logs are written to disk the upgrade having been done with sc linux in permissive mode a second reboot is needed to relabel the entire root file system Here we are. The system is fully operational after the third reboot. The systemd lib prism service is started during this boot process. The release is locked to the current upgraded version thanks to the subscription manager. A first boot phase actor is also executed. It can be a custom actor the main goal being to add some custom post-upgrade actions, especially for third-party software, like enabling a given service. And uh, some cleanups are done, including the removal of this resume service itself. Now let's reboot the system. Here I'm also skipping some parts since it takes a lot of time. Package are currently under installation. Now all the package have been upgraded and a new initramfs corresponding to the new kernel is generated. Grub2 is installed. It's almost finished. The system is now upgraded. It reboots to relabel the file system. Done. Here we can see the very last phase with the Liprism service. The upgrade is successful. The upgrade operation is almost done. However, 
it remains a few actions for the user. The system has rebooted in SLinux permissive mode, so it's time to go back to enforcing by setting it persistently. Of course, this step can be bypassed if SLinux was disabled from the beginning. The second thing to have in mind, the rel version has been locked and you might want to unset it in order to have the updates from the latest rel version. Here is a focus on how to debug that upgrade process. Most problems are related to the user configuration. The logs and reports are usually enough to fix the encountered issue. To have a better understanding of what is failing, adding the debug switch can help, as it prints every single command launched by lib. If a true bug is suspected, stress is our best friend, as usual. The resulting file is very huge, but combined with the debug mode, it's not too hard to determine what happens just before the failure. If an issue occurs in the reboot step, it can be more complex, like a can boot case. We need to add some parameters to the kernel command line to fetch the serial console and the full boot log and to possibly enable the init runfs debug mode. It is also feasible to insert some breakpoints upgrade which stops the execution just before upgrading the packages and leap upgrade which breaks just after that. Let me give you an example. In a recent case, a customer got the following error message. Cannot set the container mode for the subscription manager. In to practice, it's something done by creating a symlink in the slash etc directory inside the container. During the upgrade process, it's the very first write operation in that container. In that case, unfortunately, debug logs are not enough. Thus, we need to stress the lib process to get some evidence. As per the debug log, we know the symlink is created via systemd and spawn. So, we look for the execve call that runs that command to find out the PID, and then we look around the end of this process just before it exited with an error. And what can we notice here? The slash etc host file does not exist on this system. Despite removing that file is not strictly forbidden, it's not very common. But as you know, users uh, might be very creative. By comparing with an stress on the test system, we can see the slash etc host file is bind mounted into the container just after the check. Since the file doesn't exist on the customer system, that explains why systemd and spawn fails and why lib printed this message. Creating again that file as it comes by default fix the issue. Before ending this presentation, here are some useful links from the official documentation to some articles explaining how to customize the upgrade process. Any questions?